Good morning. So I know many of you are tired from being up late working on your projects, but I'll try to keep this engaging enough. I'm, I'm going to give an overview of the Blue Brain Project uh, in a bit of a different way than I normally do, partially because you've, you've been learning about other aspects uh, of the project from other talks at this, in this course. So the, the talks earlier, you learned about single cell modeling. After me, you'll learn about the microcircuit modeling and the whole brain modeling. So I'll really gl uh, glance over those, but give a perspective into some of the other aspects of the project that, uh, that might be interesting. So first of all, blue brain, I think that very often there's a lot of confusion about blue brain versus human brain. And it's important. Blue Brain is a Swiss brain initiative. It's really a Swiss national research project. Its core funding is from the Swiss government. So as you learned, we are based at the campus Biotech in, in Geneva, Switzerland, but we're part of the EPFL, the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. So we're actually part of a, a, a Lausanne institution on this new campus in Geneva. And we're also a, a founding partner of the Human Brain Project and, and continue to, to make uh, major contributions there. So our mission is really to use biologically detailed, what we call digital reconstructions and simulations of mammalian brains to identify fundamental principles of brain structure and function in health and disease. We'll talk more about what that actually means, and you'll learn more in the, in the subsequent talks. This is a picture of the campus biotech. So you can see this is a very uh, modern building. It actually is the former campus of Merck Serono, a pharmaceutical company. So it's a bit unusual to be an academic project inside such an amazing uh, building. But there's actually a, a great collection of other organizations that are on this campus. So the Wyss Institute for Neuro and, and Bioengineering, the Swiss Institute for Bioinformatics, the Center for Neuroprosthetics. So it's really building into a very rich environment. Um, and, and we're happy to be there. So the leadership of Blue Brain, uh, Henry Markram, of course, is the, is the founder and directs the Simulation Neuroscience Division. I lead the Neuroinformatics Division. Felix Sherman leads computing. And we've recently uh, brought on a director of operations, uh, Adriana Salvatore, who really is playing a key role in, in managing a, a project management office. We're, we're, uh, I'll, I'll go into that in a moment. We also have an academic side, so principal investigators and labs. So of course, Henry Markram's lab, Catherine Bess Hel Hess Bellwald, uh, who's a mathematician, has a laboratory for topology and neuroscience. My lab and Felix Sherman's lab for neurosimulation technologies, and we're, and we're hiring for a new tenure track uh, assistant professor. But we are a bit of a hybrid organization between academia and something sort of like a tech startup because we do operate as a facility and with a set of, of core infrastructure and capabilities to enable these digital reconstructions. So while we have these competency areas in terms of simulation, uh, neuroinformatics, computing, and operations, we also have the academic side of things which drive the science uh, that then employs the various uh, capabilities of this system. So the first proof of principle that, we, that Blue Brain started with was reconstructing neocortical microcircuitry. And the point was not to build the one be-all, end-all, single model of neocortical microcircuitry, but to build an entire infrastructure, a set of processes, workflows, and uh, technology to make it possible to do this for other brain areas. And, that, and so we started here, and this was very important because it also pr provided the template for the type of data that we needed to get started. Um, Henry Markram had spent 15 years with his lab measuring many different aspects of one single cortical microcircuit. So characterizing the electrophysiology, the morphology, the synaptic connectivity, the synaptic dynamics, the long-term plasticity, the cellular composition, the cellular densities, many different aspects of this single uh, circuit. 
And so reconstructing individual 3D morphologies, doing paired reconstructions of connected cells to get the putative synaptic locations, the uh, cyto pulling out the cytoplasm of cells to, to screen for gene expression products. Um, and this set of data was kind of the starting point for how we worked. But what's important about that is that it was all very, at least relatively well standardized and um, always on Wistarat, always prim primary somatosensory cortex, more or less hind limb, uh, postnatal day 14, working in these in vitro brain slices, consistent intracellular, extracellular solutions and, and, and multi-patch setups. So the, there was a lot of standardization both in terms of the solutions and the, the setups. Standardized protocols for stimulation, and we have this thing called ECODE, a set of standardized electrical stimulation protocols for injecting current at the soma. And these are examples of the different shapes of them that are, that are injected. And these were used to systematically profile the electrical behavior of the neurons within this microcircuit. So by, by having, you know, at the time we didn't know what was the best stimulus to actually characterize and, and, and get elicit the voltage responses from the cells. Um, so we did this, you know, this huge number of different sweeps. Now we've refined it and we, and we know that actually the square pulse set of stimuli with increasing amplitude, what we call ID rest, are, is actually very effective at uh, eliciting the, the dynamics of the neuron. And this has also been used to characterize 11 electrical types of, of neurons. You'll learn more about that later. Also using standardized protocols for characterizing the synaptic dynamics, so short-term plasticity between different cell types. And by using this protocol, um, basically a series of uh, bursts, a series of presynaptic spikes ranging at 50 to 70 hertz, a pause and then a, and a subsequent spike, actually it, it provides enough information to parameterize a detailed model of short-term plasticity, the sodex markram model. And this, this particular example shows that individual neurons can actually form synapses onto their postsynaptic targets with completely different short-term dynamics. So in this case, the um, left pyramidal cell is being stimulated with this protocol. The right pyramidal cell, this cell, is responding. These are the postsynaptic potentials. And you see that it's a depressing response where the, the connection is gradually getting weaker and weaker within just milliseconds. So on, that's a depressing synapse. On the other hand, when, where this pyramidal cell synapses onto this interneuron, there's actually a facilitatory response. So that connection is getting stronger. And this is actually a very important uh, principle. And using the protocols, we've mapped out the different types of facilitating and depressing uh, excitatory and inhibitory uh, connections. And you'll learn a bit more about, about that later. I've also done work in microconnectomics. Um, now this is really not at the EM level, but using light microscopy to infer putative synaptic connections. And so in, in this case, uh, in the case of paired reconstruction of cells, so you basically identify one cell in a, with, a post, with a patch clamp setup, find a, another cell, identify if they're connected electrophysiologically, so you see that there really is a synaptic connection. And then you fill both cells with biocytin, reconstruct the three-dimensional shapes of both of those cells, and then you can follow the axon of the presynaptic cell all the way along wherever it comes close to the dendrite of the postsynaptic cell. And there are specific criteria for identifying do these actually have a putative synapse or not. Um, basically, if you have a bouton on the axon within the same focal plane as a postsynaptic process, either a spine or a swelling, um, that is what we consider a putative synapse. And when you do an EM validation on this, you see that about 80% 80, 80 of those uh, observations are actually real validatable synapses, functional synapses. And when you don't see that, we don't count it as a synapse in, in the light microscopy. So using that, we gathered a large set from many paired reconstructions 
a large set of distributions of where do the synapses actually occur on the axon and the dendrite. And so this gives us what we call an innervation pattern. So what's the proportion of synapses that occur at which branch order on the axon and at which branch order, uh, so first of all at the soma, but also then along the basal, apical, and tuft uh, of the dendrites. And this, be this became a fundamental data set that you'll learn more about uh, as well in, in Michael's talk. So also using this approach of patch clamping cells, filling them with biocyte and, and, and reconstructing them uh, gave us example neuron morphologies for what we, we believe are pretty much all of the cell types within this. So there are 55 morphological types of neuron that have been identified. On this side are the inhibitory interneurons from layer one, two, three, four, five, and six. You can see Martinotti cells, bitufted cells, double bouquet cells, bipolar cells, uh, neurogliaform cells, large baskets, nest baskets, small baskets, and chandeliers. And then you've got the excitatory pyramidal cells and stellate cells uh, on the right. But as I had mentioned in the introduction to this course, um, we don't see that there will be a time in the near future where we will ever be able to acquire all of the data of, of a living functioning system, structural and functional, at the same time. It's simply not feasible. So our approach is to actually use informatics, use a computer to create a digital reconstruction based on the sparse data that is available. Sparse being, for example, the morphologies, the electrophysiology, the cell densities, the cell types. Use that and, and identify principles through which we can create a dense reconstruction, but digitally. And in some ways, we see this as continuing on uh, the work that Cajal did with the beautiful paintings of actually going through and making a synthesis of all of the different cell types that were observed and inferring circuitry and uh, dynamics from that. So you see, if you look at the Cajal's writings, he actually came up with a lot of deep insight as to the functioning of the nervous system and brain circuitry just from these Golgi stains and from the, the identifying the elements of the circuit and, and inferring a lot. But we want to take that a step further now that we have computers that can handle large amounts of data, three-dimensional uh, reconstructions. So we take the, the paintings of Cajal to the next step, do it digitally, and use it as also as a way of integrating more data and more knowledge to better understand and better predict principles of the structure and function of the circuit. And so this is also a slide that I showed at the beginning, but this is really the process that is at the heart of Blue Brain, uh, which is starting from data, uh, starting from data from the lab, from the literature, from other existing models, building models, running simulations on supercomputers and high performance computing, using software to visualize and analyze the output of those simulations, and validating the models, endlessly validating the models at all different levels. You'll learn again about some of the specific aspects of validation um, from Michael, but this is a, a critical process. It's not that we think that one day you stop and there's the perfect circuit, right? It's not about that. It's much more about using this process as a way of building a tool for integrating the available data and knowledge so that we can test out hypotheses and use that to direct new experiments and identify what would be the most valuable new piece of data to get. Use this as a way of maintaining our current data and knowledge in an integrated form as a computer model that you can then use through simulation to ask questions. So to do this, we over the last 10 years, we really built um, a set of software and we, can, we assembled a set of hardware, computer infrastructure to support this process. These are just some of the publications describing the processes and the methods that, that go into this. 
but of organizing the experimental data, building models from the data, so data-driven modeling, you've learned about that um, for single cells, you'll learn about that for microcircuits and whole brain, uh, running simulations, performing these analysis and visualization. Visualization is actually a very key part of this, uh, given the complexity of, this, of the system. Visualization gives you an important tool to understanding what's actually happening in the system. And then developing a lot of custom software, working also uh, with the community on open source software. We've made a, a lot of contributions to the development of Neuron in collaboration with Michael Hines. Um, and, and so we've got a lot of open source software, as well as we use off-the-shelf software. There's also uh, hardware. We've had a very good technology partnership with IBM, and as you heard, that's how I got involved in the project, was, was with IBM. And there, uh, we've, we've had some great research collaborations bringing in uh, kind of customized supercomputing to enable us to do some of the specific, uh, to address some of the specific challenges that we have with the large-scale simulation and analysis. So another aspect is how do you organize the data in order to support the data-driven modeling? So this is a newer aspect, and this was developed uh, in the context of the Human Brain Project, but it's also really at the heart of Blue Brain in terms of serving all of the data-driven modeling. How do you organize the data across scales, in different species and in atlases. Um, we've got an architecture that includes you know, data, so the data can be distributed, a data space, knowledge graph for actually registering all of the data and being able to find the relationships between data sets, um, a data registration application for, for curating and registering data, search capabilities, a search engine for very heterogeneous data, but it's all data that has to be curated and registered. Um, atlases, having standard template spaces and ontologies for registering the data. And then a knowledge space, which I'll show you in a moment, which is, which is really also providing an interface to other, first of all, a, a definition for all the brain concepts in terms of brain areas or cell types, but also then linking out to a federated search of many different databases around the world, uh, not only uh, data curated by Blue Brain, but also looking to see what data is out there in terms of morphology and gene expression and electrophysiology for that particular cell type or brain region and so on. And I'll show you that in a moment. So for the brain atlases, this is a little bit of a view here on for a rat brain atlas. So this is actually the Voxholm rat brain and the parcellation that you see. So we've registered a data set actually from the Wuhan group that you learned about yesterday, um, Qingming Lo's group that did this whole brain Golgi preparation of the rat brain. And since it's registered to the, to the Voxholm rat, we have the parcellations then. So when you look at a morphology, you can see which brain area is it actually coming from. And when you zoom in on this, you actually, you can see individual neuron morphologies. Um, and we can actually use machine vision to go in and trace these. Now, Golgi isn't giving you the most complete uh, fill of all of the cells, but what's great is that with that we get a sampling of the morphologies across the whole brain. We also have integrated the latest uh, Allen mouse brain atlas, and in, in fact this is a movie is a little out of date. We have their latest common coordinate <coughs> framework from 2016, but we have a link, I, I, it was a little bit fast there, where you can click on a brain area and it, it will take you to the search for in the knowledge space. And that's really um, one of the next things that I'll talk about. But when we're registered, when we're talking about neuroscience data sets, um, and when we're talking about the great diversity, how diverse neuroscience data sets can be, we have to think of, well, what's the minimum information that we need to be able to just to find any given data set, right? So there is, there is, always going to be more information that you need. If you want to do specific electrophysiological analysis, you need more metadata. But if you want to just discover any type of data, what is it you need to know? And we, we came up with a proposal, and we're calling this the minimum information for neuroscience data sets, MINDS. Uh, we have a formal specification for it. 
but it includes details like the subject details, so the, the age, the sex, the species, the strain, um, the methods, and this is very important, what were the methods used, and just have an identifier for the, that particular method that was used to acquire the data. We don't have to provide a machine readable version of all of the details of that, but just an identifier to register that method. That's a specific method that was used. A classification, a set of classifications in terms of the data category. So is it electrophysiology? Is it fMRI imaging? Is it EM? Uh, and then we're maintaining an ontology that actually takes into account the more specific, say the perforated patch versus the whole cell patch clamp, the different specific um, methods and then the types of data uh, that come out of that. The data format, cell types, if there's a classification. The brain location then is also provided in, in a way as two things. One is a semantic tag to say this came from uh, the, me, me, say the dorsal uh, thalamus. Or in addition, we can give the location as a spatial specification in a particular atlas space. So by having these spaces, we can give specific coordinates, or we can give the semantic label, which can be translated to mm. spatial coordinates. Uh, and of course, keeping track of the contributors and their affiliations, the PI, the lab, this is essential, <coughs> right? Because we want to be sure uh, to give credit for, to all those who produced and contributed to the data. And then, in addition, have a URL. Ideally, a persistent identifier, a, a, a DOI, or a specific um, persistent identifier to where can you actually access that data. Now, it may be that some data is actually protected. You have to have an agreement to get it. But we want to register it. We want to discover it. We want to be able to find it. And we store that minimal information, that mines metadata, in what we call a, a provenance-based knowledge graph. And this knowledge graph is built off of the W3C provenance standard. This is important. It's, a st it's an open standard for specifying where do things come from? How were they produced? Who contributed to them? And in this case, we're using it for data provenance. So for example, one particular data set came from a particular specimen, in this case, a rat. We sampled that specimen in this case, through a Golgi stain process and slicing the brain. We then uh, did machine vision segmentation to pull out a neuron morphology from that. And all of this, the process, the version of the software is registered so that you can track when you get the extracted neuron morphology, where did it come from, including the space so that you know where in the original uh, brain was this from, using which software and which humans were involved in this process, so that we're all, also making it more reproducible, but also giving credit uh, to who contributed this. So this is at its early stages. It's going to take a while to, to develop this out and make sure that all of that metadata is, is being entered automatically. Right now we're doing a lot of manual curation, but the APIs are will be there. Then this is a search engine. This is an early version of the search engine where you can go in and you can navigate just by clicking or you can type in a free search. But here you can see we can find the Allen Institute parcellations for the mouse brain or you can go in and, and find uh, say morphologies from these are the different type ways you can filter the data from uh, the institution, the species, the contributors. We can look for the rat data. Um, there's human data, anatomical parcellations of the human brain, um, and then we can also find, you know, make specific queries and get exactly, say, the electrophysiological traces from one particular brain area that were done using a specific protocol. And this is a way that also programmatically, when you're running a script to build a model, you go through the, the search API, you can issue a specific query and get the traces performed with the protocol you need to extract the features and build the model. So that's the idea is provide a user interface, but also an API for automating these processes. All right. So then the knowledge space, which I mentioned earlier, it's actually um, kind of a critical piece of, it's a public community encyclopedia, okay? And we want everybody in the world to contribute to this. 
And what we're doing is um, populating it initially with a set of ontologies coming from um, existing efforts around the world, including the neuroscience information framework, the Uberon, um, and, and others. And this lets you go in and say, look for neocortex as an example, pull up a page, you get a definition for neocortex. You also see the latest publications, you see the, the, the publications across years, you see the position of that within an ontology in terms of the, the relationship to other brain regions, and then you can also find data that has been tagged with neocortex. And in this case, there's 14,000 morphologies that have been reconstructed from neocortex. And you can go in, we found there's a set of them from the Allen Brain Mouse uh, Atlas, and we can pull them up from that interface. And so you can also do that programmatically, basically go in, find a morphology reconstructed from a particular brain area and get access to it. So it's a tool also to discover models, gene expression, uh, basically, we, we consider any data that we, we can federate the access to, any models, and any literature. We want access. So for modelers, this becomes a very key resource. If you want to find electrophysiological properties or existing models, you can go here, type in a search, find things related to even, say, to a Martinotti cell or a specific hippocampal brain region, and go in and get that information from, for example, open source brain, and, and other efforts. So it's really a way for us to, one, we want to, we want to first reinforce internally that we're using consistent vocabulary. We also want to give value to the community to use consistent vocabulary and terminology when talking about a brain cell or a brain region. So that if, if you do, and you publish your data either on one of those repositories or we're gonna hook this up to Figshare. So if your data goes into Figshare, we can search for that, ter that term and it will show up as data that's out there related to this concept. And through that way, we want, again, we want to add value. Please, everybody, try to use consistent terminology so that we can discover things in a, in a, in a uniform way. And also to help maintain the definition of these concepts. I mean, very often uh, terms come into, you know, when you talk about uh, a Martinotti cell, well, there are a lot of publications out there that actually, um, you know, would, would talk about it in terms of uh, the somatostatin or a specific marker. And what we want to do is we want to make that interface so that you can discover data across the different ways in which you might characterize a Martinotti cell and integrate that into an ontology so that you can, f you can maintain these relationships. But we also want to encourage people when they do publish to use standard identifiers for cell types. So another aspect um, of Blue Brain is a channelome project. And this is a work that's been led by Rajneesh Ranjan and this comes ag about because when you're talking about characterizing electrical behavior of a neuron, well, what, what is it that generates the electrical behavior? There are proteins called ion channels that sit in the membranes of neurons, and there's a lot of them. There are about 350 ion channels expressed in the in the brain, about 200 of them are voltage activated. And if you inject a current into the soma of a neuron, this voltage response is actually fully generated by these ion channels with the gradients of different ion populations generating the potential. And so here you've got potassium currents and sodium currents and uh, different, many different classes, persistent sodium, calcium, chloride, many different uh, channels that are shaping these voltage responses. And the challenge for us was that if you go into the literature to find a model or to find data about ion channels, it's a mess. Virtually all of the ion channels have been characterized uh, maybe partially um, in different species, under different temperature conditions, all of these things that really make a big impact 
on the dynamics. So we're working with, sometimes if you look through uh, you know, NeuronDB, you see models that are constructed with a crayfish ion channel uh, at, at room temperature, <laughs> and then another one which has um, you know, a, a 15 degree uh, mouse uh, channel and another what you know and there's this hodgepodge of different things and kinetics that really don't make any sense and aren't coming from any kind of a consistent um, environment so we we are trying to start to address that challenge through the channel ohm project by cloning ion channels expressing them in Chinese hamster ovarian cells uh, human embryonic kidney cells and others these oocytes to be able to um, so we basically tr transfect these, get the expression of these ion channels in the oocytes, and use a patch clamp robot to actually go in, form a seal with that cell, and characterize these ion channel kinetics with a standardized biophysical assay. And so by doing this, we can control the temperature, we can validate the expression of the channels, we can make sure, we're, we're making sure that there are not other voltage-gated channels interfering with that characterization. And so we're getting very systematic, clear uh, characterization and, and mostly automated so that we can automate the building of Hodgkin-Huxley-style models. Now we're also developing other methods of of building those models, but this allows us to, in a high throughput way, build models of ion channels where we know the genetic identity of the channel because we're actually expressing that bit of DNA in that specific cell. Uh, and that's, a, that's another aspect. Very often when, when uh, current, what, what's happening in, in neurons is usually currents are being characterized. Now currents are collections of lots of different genetic ion channels, typically. Right. Here we can look at all of the individual components in terms of genetically specific ion channels and their kinetics, their opening and closing kinetics under controlled conditions and learn, see about the species differences and we've, we've been studying that, what's different between mouse, rat and human uh, and temperature differences and that's actually a very, very significant fact that um, we'll be publishing about soon. And this has allowed us, for example, uh, to, to prepare a, a full map of the entire KV family, um, again, with the team led by Rajneesh Ranjan and a publication that's forthcoming. In addition to this, we have created an effort called Channelpedia, a website, channelpedia.org, where we see this ultimately getting integrated with knowledge space, but this was, this was done prior to, to knowledge space. And it contains a lot of information about ion channels, uh, reviews of the literature, and also links then to the data and the models that were uh, generated within the channel ohm project. And it also links out to a number of other databases for referencing to other uh, known data about these channels. And so that's a, another resource and a knowledge management tool for ion channels. So as I had mentioned, um, the literature is actually a, a very important source of data, um, but it takes careful uh, consideration about which parameters do you trust from the literature, under which conditions were they measured. Um, and we also want to integrate those into the model building process in a way that uh, it's not just hard coding a parameter in a script, um, but we know which paper did that come from, and when there's updated information, we want to be able to replace that information in a, in a useful way. So we've built a tool called NeuroCurator, and this allows you to go through and annotate, say, a PDF uh, of a paper and extract key parameters, things like a synaptic conductance, a resting, resting membrane potential, maybe a protein concentration, um, actually highlight it in the location from the paper and then annotate it with the metadata that we need to be able to store it in a database, query it, and embed it in a computer model. So when we're into the modeling process, in such a way that we can actually track the provenance of that parameter, which 
reference did it come from? Where in that reference? What were the transformations that you had to do to make it be in the right scale or the right units to actually fit into the modeling process? And um, this work has been led by Christian O'Reilly. Um, and this involves a set of services uh, and ontologies and user interfaces uh, to allow users, and Elisabetta, who, who's here, has also been working on this and using it, and, and others in the group are, are using this. So again, it's, it's early days, but we've been building up a, a corpus of annotations which um, contain a lot, so this is the user interface, but these contain real knowledge extracted from the literature. And a lot of parameters, so there are a number of different parameters uh, ion channel conductances, resting membrane potential, cell densities. These are just some of the examples of values that have been extracted. And these feed into what, this metamodeler pro program, which actually allows you to embed within your code with some tags. You can say, I want the, this parameter from the, from the annotation database. And it keeps track of where did it come from, how was it normalized, and which reference did it come from, and embeds that into the code. So it gives a tool then for making that link. Now what's important also about building up this annotation corpus is that then you've got a bunch of expert identified parameters from a large body of literature. And, and this becomes very valuable for text mining because now you can train a text mining system to start suggesting useful parameters, useful things for modeling from the literature. So we have also done some work in text mining. Um, and, and this is important because we, we need a way of rapidly going through the literature. We don't really see that we're going to fully automate pulling out model parameters from the literature. It's not, in the current state, it's not really feasible. You still need the expert to look at it, look at the specifics, understand the context in which that parameter was measured. That's probably not going to go away in the near term. But we do need to be able to rapidly identify potential parameters, potential knowledge, uh, to accelerate the review of the literature so that we can extract a lot of what's called long tail data, which is out there in the literature, but it's really not accessible. And this is, a, this is a, a challenge. I mean, most of this long tail data is in printed documents. It's in these PDFs. It's not structured in any kind of a way where you can easily find it, access it, search it. Um, this is an ongoing problem because, you know, even if we're getting better with publishing and sharing data and open access, all of these things, we're still not structuring tables and uh, specific parameters. They're still embedded in the mess of human natural language, sorry to say, uh, or the beauty of human natural language, we could say. But it makes it a real challenge to actually use it. So it was a wonderful invention of Gutenberg, but we're at a point where we need to be able to, to um, start standardizing how some of that data is made available to make it searchable. In the meantime, uh, you know, there are a lot of papers, about one new paper each minute coming out. Um, most of the valuable knowledge is embedded in those papers and we need ways to pull it out. And so we've developed a, a framework called the Bluema framework. It's built off of the um, UIMA, uh, natural language parsing, from IBM, which is part of their Watson technologies. And one of the elements of that is named entity recognition, where you can take a sentence, the interstitial nucleus of the posterior limb of the anterior commissure lies at the junction of the stri striatopalital system. And it can recognize within all of this um, that there's a, a region. So it's got a, it's got a vocabulary that it can identify named entities from this text and identify what type of entity are they uh, from this. So it identifies that there's a brain region, the interstitial nucleus of the, is a relationship, region, posterior limb of the anterior commissure. Um, so again, it builds up these graphs that parse out the sentences into these entities that can then be further processed. Um, and we can do things like mining out specific values, 
um, 5,450 5, plus or minus 1,260. Look for the units. Now, we, did th we tried this for mining protein concentrations, and we discovered there are just too many ways of reporting protein concentrations. And it's so diverse, and it's very hard to get reliable values of, of any form. It basically, you know, maybe we were at 60% accuracy, but it was, it was just not uh, really working. But we have the tools to be able to go in and find those, and we do see um, using the annotated corpus for parameters as a way of training these systems to do better. But another thing that we did was to accelerate the review of connectivity statements about the brain um, and look at metascale brain connectivity. And so here we could identify more easily statements that, that make assertions about connections between brain areas. The nucleus accumbens receives projections from both the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area. Specific connectivity statement parsed out of that. And so we, there, these are a number of different forms of connectivity statements that can be identified. And we used a number of different entity recognizers to, to identify and normalize the brain region names because the brain regions, as we talked about before, can be called by many different names, but by using lists of synonyms, we can normalize them to standard uh, brain region names. And then we developed a number of extractors to predict the connectivity, the probability of um, brain region co-occurrences, but then we looked for specific connectivity statements within those co-occurrences. So some prior work had just looked for co-occurrences, but that could be, there could be a negative statement saying this brain region is not uh, connected to another brain region. We're looking for specific positive statements of connectivity and uh, built a system which is open source here um, to actually identify that. So we applied this to 13.2 million PubMed abstracts, 630,000 full text publications and um, identified that there were about four million mentions according to the Allen Brain Atlas terminology, and about seven million with terms that are in the Brain Architecture Management System, another system that has um, brain regions registered in it. There are over 100,000 potential brain region connections and, uh, for using the Allen Brain Atlas terminology, and 160,000 with the BAMs. And we did a test to see how well, just out of curiosity, how well did the connectivity that we could mine from the literature compare to the, the connectivity that the Allen has mined through direct data measurements in the mouse brain by, with, through these injections. And we built a connectivity matrix so you can actually compare, compare the two. On the left is the Allen uh, connectivity and on the, on the right is from the literature. It's not that we think that you, you, know, you can usefully mine a connectivity matrix from the literature, but this shows that we're getting pretty good coverage and comparable uh, connectivity statements, and it's a tool then for accelerating the review. So you can click on any one of those and pull up the specific papers and the specific statements and assertions that were made about the connectivity and use that if you're interested in particular brain connectivity to, go, to zoom in on the literature that makes those statements. So it's a way of accelerating the review. So to support all of the efforts in Blue Brain to do data mining, um, uh, data, large scale data management, simulation, visualization, and so on, uh, we've assembled a high performance computing infrastructure that are really driven by the scientific goals, so the multi-compartment neuron modeling, the detailed microcircuit that you'll learn about, the meso circuit you'll, you'll also he hear about, and this refinement process. I mean, one of the key aspects is that iteration and being able to run simulations many, many times using different parameters, different configurations. That's an essential part of it, and that adds significant computing requirements to be able to do that iteratively. But we're also, um, so as we're scaling up to the, to the whole rodent brain, we're continually growing our computing ability, but we also have other drivers, which are 
in, you know, there, these are more minor aspects of the project, but they're important nonetheless in simulating subcellular aspects of single neurons or, or pieces of tissue and uh, multi-scale cellular, subcellular simulations, or even large-scale but simplified uh, networks as well. And so this supporting a range of simulations across different levels of detail um, and making that accessible and reproducible has been the driver for building this high-performance computing infrastructure, which involves an elastic compute service um, or infrastructure for deploying our visualization and analysis code, supporting continuous integration and continuous deployment. So uh, most of our teams operate in an agile manner and deploy these things on bi after biweekly sprints, sprints. There are new uh, deployments. Um, and so it's, it's really a very professional software engineering uh, environment and the infrastructure to support that. We also have production high performance computing for uh, model development. This is an IBM Blue Gene Q um, for building the models, building the reconstructions, running the simulations, and for testing out and doing software development. And then we have some specific uh, aspects that we're exploring uh, with IBM on ways in which we can, we can test different architectures for doing more advanced analysis and interactive supercomputing. We also have to be able to deal with these large-scale data. So as you, you learned already in, in a number of the previous talks, the size of the data, these whole brain data sets, the ability to actually use machine learning to trace these uh, neurons or to take manual reconstructions and proofread them and improve them, we need to be able to easily handle data sets that are on the order of eight terabytes per, per data set. And also to do things like very large scale image processing. So how do you, when we get these, they often have imaging artifacts. And now imaging artifacts are kind of normal. Everybody deals with that. There's lots of software to do that. But when you have an eight terabyte data set, it changes the scale of the problem. And um, so in this case, we have to eliminate this artifact. You see that as, as you're going through and cutting the ribbon in your imaging, there are these intensity variations, which are artifacts which are pretty easy to remove if you're going dealing with just one slice, but to do this across the whole thing in a uniform way and for eight terabytes or, or larger uh, is, a, is a significant challenge. So we've, we've built a, a Spark cluster and we use software that can automatically uh, take care of distributing sub-portions of these very, very large images across the nodes of the system and operate it in parallel. So you're actually programming in Python, but you're dealing with you know, a very huge image and the system is taking care of parcelating that across the nodes. So this thing is highly scalable. Uh, we, can, we can basically go up to, you know, um, I don't know, we haven't tested the limits yet, but keep scaling the number of nodes. We can add uh, very easily. And here, you know, we just show one example of if you're just doing this on, uh, for one single image, removing the, the artifacts on image J on a single node, you're at 70 minutes of compute time, and when you do it on Spark with two nodes, 32 cores, so 16 cores per node, you get a, a major reduction in time. And, and this is something that will continue scaling out. We also use this for uh, aligning to brain atlases, managing the warping and alignment of, of images. In this case, we, we um, work to, anal to take the Paxinos Watson atlas, which is, um, a bunch of 2D sections, and they're not really well aligned in 3D. They weren't built to be 3D. They were 2D, very high quality parcellations. And we needed them to work in 3D for our model building process. And so we did alignment of these images to improve the quality um, and to get the parcellations through, through not only the 2D, but the 3D space. And we use that then to link literature facts, so when we're mining out of the, the literature, properties such as cell density, we, can ta we tag them as part of neurocurator, we tag them with the brain region, and 
build up the hierarchy of the different regions within the thalamus. So we know that there are these sub-regions. There's the anterior group, there's the thalamic reticular nucleus, there's the lateral nuclear group, which then breaks up into sub-regions. And we have properties that, we, that are attached through the tagging process of the annotation to those brain regions. Now we have an API called the voxel brain API that lets you query when you're going to do a brain building you can query from the database based on the semantic tag for specific properties. What is the neuron density? What are the cell types? Uh, how many of them are there within this particular nucleus? And uses that to build out and populate the volume with those neuron types with those vo volume, uh, within those volume boundaries. So this is a way to support data-driven modeling and building linked to the literature, but through a, a data-driven API linked to the brain atlases. So now I'll go really fairly quickly because you're going to learn a, a lot of the details um, in the talks to come. But data-driven model building, as I've mentioned, is a key part. But visualization, I think many times when people see um, things like this, they think, oh, that's a nice uh, sort of artistic movie. But these are, all of the visualizations I'm about to go through are data-driven, right? They're, they're built directly from the models, from the simulations. This is a single model, single cell model of a pyramidal cell using the techniques you've learned about from, from Werner. Um, and it really captures the electrical dynamics. And visualization actually is a great tool to see that, is this thing behaving? in a way that we would expect. When we see a back-propagating action potential on here, is it behaving in a way that we would expect? Of course you have to do the analysis as well, but, but visualization uh, is a very important tool to making sense out of the complexity, especially as you start to go in and build up a circuit, um, and you start populating these boundaries, so you pulling out the information, building up the, the, the volume by placing these cells within that three-dimensional space, you're building up a virtual circuit. <coughs> but being able to see uh, where are those cell types, where are they uh, being placed, but also what's happening inside of that, right? What's the relationship then between the axons and the dendrites and, and seeing that the rules are also implemented in terms of the somatic spacing and the density, overall density, and this type of thing. It's a very valuable tool to be able to visualize this. Um, and then, of course, it can also be fun. Just say, what would it be like if I flew through that circuit? Um, but it, it's also, it's a powerful way to communicate about the science, to be able to show what is this digital reconstruction? What does it look like? And how do you look at it from different perspectives? And, you know, it, for us, that we could find order and principles in what is apparently so random when you look at it there and so complex is, is actually very motivating. This is a, another example where you, you can see then a pyramidal cell and the axons and highlight one particular neuron and see its relationship to other neurons with, within that network context. And um, again, it's, it's, a, it's a powerful way to see also for a neuroscientist, what does it mean for the, the extent of these single cell fibers to actually come into contact with the full diversity of other fibers. We can color them based on their, their cell type. We can look at them in terms of what all, let's show all the cells that are presynaptic, all the cells that are postsynaptic. So it becomes a very valuable tool just to build intuition also about the circuit. And then when you run simulations, of course, if you just look at a long list of numbers and uh, some, some two-dimensional graphs, it's not going to give you the same impression as being able to actually see the electrical activity mapped onto the three-dimensional structure of the cells and the microcircuit. So it's an important tool. And then building a, a three-dimensional slice, so this is comparable to a slice that you would actually do experiments on in a Petri dish, um, and being able to see the activity on that. Also, when we worked also in collaboration with the Allen Institute, Christoph Koch and, and Koch and uh, Kostas Anastasio on modeling the local field potential, um, I'll turn up the volume here, to be able to see in the context of the neurons and the circuit 
what is the local field potential? So this is the summation of all the extracellular potentials generated by each individual neuron and to be able to listen to it. Right? This is what an electrophysiologist, a neurophysiologist, if they put an electrode into the system, they're going to hear the sound, which is what we're also able to visualize in a volumetric sense in conjunction with the structure of the neurons producing it. So this is work that was actually done by Michael Ryman, who you'll hear about next. Um, and this is, a, again, showing both the value of building the model, being able to, to calculate local field potential, but the visualization and the sound really contributes to understanding uh, what it's producing. So th this paper, again, will be uh, discussed in greater detail by Michael in the subsequent talk, but I, I want to emphasize that the way that Blue Brain works is very much a team science approach. It's, it's, it can present its challenges, significant challenges, because of the current uh, incentive and reward systems in, in, in neuroscience. Physics has, has learned how to do this better. Um, we followed actually a lot of the principles for author, authorship uh, when we put together the 82 authors on that cell paper. Um, but it's, a, it's an important transition. I think the Allen Institute has, has learned a lot and, set, and laid the ground, you know, sort of been the pioneers in, how, in doing this as well, having large-scale team neuroscience. And um, I think that's something that we'll see more of going forward. So all of this, the model, everything is available on a, a portal, so disseminating this. Uh, through the Blue Brain Neural Microcircuit portal. Um, you can interrogate the model, look at simulations, download models. Um, and then as part of the Human Brain Project, of course, the Blue Brain leads the, the brain simulation platform. So within the HBP collaboratory, uh, the brain simulation platform is embedded in there. And this is where we're taking all of the tools and all the things that uh, you've been learning about and disseminating that through uh, the Human Brain Project. And some of the drivers of that are the, uh, also these co-design projects and subcellular modeling, cerebellar modeling, uh, cortical microcircuit taking it further or simplifying it to point neurons, modeling basal ganglia, hippocampus, and human cells. And this is, you, again, using the same infrastructure, using the same set of tools, but applying it to different brain areas and different uh, modeling challenges. And this is, again, it's a set of services accessible primarily through REST APIs. So this provides a very flexible way to, to build new tools, to build new capabilities, integrate them with this. Finally, uh, neural glial vasculature coupling and taking into account the glia, the relationship to neuron, neurons activity, and the vasculature is, is absolutely critical. We've been doing a good amount of work on that in collaboration with Pierre Magistretti at KAUST and, um, and also uh, Renaud Jolivet uh, has published a model here um, really describing the specific relationship and energetics um, coupled be coupling between neurons, glia, and vasculature. And you'll learn more from Chaba about some of the efforts to scale up this whole system, the whole process to the whole rodent brain, populating that also with neuron morphologies. And then, and I, I don't wanna take too much, but also supporting large scale simulations in the, in the whole brain context. So this is a, a snapshot in time of, blue, of the Blue Brain team. Um, they, it's really, again, it's a team effort. This is not about, uh, you know, my work, this is really about a wonderful team of people who have collaborated over many years to, to build all of these pieces. We don't have everybody there on that day, but it's, uh, it's really been thanks to them that we've been able to, to do this. So thank you, and I can take any questions.